Welcome to note set number 25 where we're going to uh, learn a little bit more about partial fraction expansion uh, specifically for the Z transform. So the idea um, is that we take some complicated ratio of polynomials um, not that complicated but um, we take some ratio of two polynomials uh, which is called a rational function of Z and we break it down into simpler terms uh, and those terms should be on our Z transform table so we can do an inverse Z transform. Now going the other way is obvious and easy. You've probably done this a million times. If we were given these two terms and said I want to get this into a, a ratio of two um, polynomials in Z that's pretty easy to do. Uh, we find a common denominator multiply each term by the other denominator. So we're going to take this, multiply top and bottom by z to the minus 1. Then we're going to take um, this and multiply top and bottom by z to the minus 2. So now we've got um, a common denominator. So we can put everything over that common denominator. Uh, and then up on the top, we do a little bit of algebra. We're going to get z squareds and z's. Uh, simplify and we get a polynomial in Z. Down on the bottom we multiply that out, get Z squared, Z's and constants and we're in business. So going that way is easy, it's just algebraic manipulation. But going the other way is a little bit harder um, and that's where partial fraction expansion method um, really comes in handy. Now notice that the denominator of the original um, is the product of the denominator of the two terms. Um, you know, when we when we went this way, that that idea is obvious. Um, so, um, you know, when we do this, um, what that's telling us is that when we're doing partial fraction expansion, we need to look at this denominator and find out what its factors are, right? If we can factor it, then we know what these individual bottom terms are. And that's kind of the key to understanding how to do this. Um, now, as I mentioned in the last video, just as a trick for helping us find things on Z transform tables, we're going to do a, a, a trick to first divide by Z, then expand, um, and then undivide by z. Uh, it, it doesn't, it's not part of the partial fraction expansion, it's just a trick so that we end up with the kinds of things that are on our table. Um, okay, so um, let's take a look at this. First characteristic structure that we want to think about here is that, um, and, and basically we need to look at these different structures will tell us different ways to deal with the partial fraction expansion. So the first characteristic structure that we want to worry about is does the denominator have repeated roots or not? Uh, the second thing we want to look for are these things called direct terms and we'll uh, deal with those a little bit more uh, when uh, through an example later on. Um, so when the order of the numerator of the function is strictly less than the order of the denominator. Now for us this is going to be after we divide by z. Um, then there are no direct terms. And if we look at the difference between the numerator order and the denominator order, um, and if that difference is a positive p value, then there's going to be p plus 1 direct terms. Um, so it'll be clear as we go through some of the examples. Um, now, what I'll expect you to be able to do is, by hand, do this for the case of real roots, no repeated roots, and no direct terms. So that's what I would expect you to be able to do um, by hand. Um, using MATLAB or your calculator or um, um, you know, some other uh, numerical method um, is encouraged for uh, the more complicated cases.
So let's go through some examples here. No direct terms, no repeated roots, no complex roots. So this is one we can do by hand, and I'll show you the method for doing it by hand, and then um, we'll talk about using MATLAB for the other ones. Um, so the idea here, uh, again, that uh, is some supposed to be a, a, a defined, so everywhere you see that rectangle here, it, it's going to be an equals with it triangle on the top. It just means we're defining y of z over z to be g of z just for notational purposes. So we're going to take this thing, we're going to divide it by z, so there's our z sitting down there. Um, and then the second step, check to see if there's any direct terms. Uh, well, the order of the numerator is 1, the order of the denominator is 3, um, so since the numerator order is less, uh, is the smaller, strictly smaller, then there will be no direct terms. Uh, third step, any repeated roots, um, and we're talking about repeated roots in the denominator. Um, so we, we factor this into z plus 2 times z plus 1. Um, you should be able to do that using the quadratic formula to find the roots and then forming the factors from there. Um, so we've got a root of 0, a root of minus 2, and a root of minus 1. Um, all distinct roots, so no repeated roots. So now we know what the form is going to be once we have um, the, the factors, um, or for that matter, the roots. So we know that we're going to have uh, a root, or a factor, a factor, a factor, and we just write a number on the top. We, can, um, we haven't proved that, but that's the form that is consistent with what we have here. Those numbers up at the top are called the residuals. Now we just have to determine what the residuals are. So in general, uh, we would have P1 through Pn distinct uh, um, roots, and those will will have a term for each one of those, uh, and we'd have a residual up on top for each of those. So the fifth step is to actually determine the residuals, and this is the formula. We take our g of z, the thing we're trying to expand, we multiply it by the factor that corresponds to that residual, and then we evaluate that whole thing at z is equal to minus p sub i. So that's the thing that makes this term go to zero. Now you might say, well, shouldn't the residual then be zero? No, because remember that this thing is sitting down in the denominator of the g of z. So we cancel those out, and we look at everything else that's left in g, and evaluate z at minus pi. Um, so all we really have to do is blot out the one that we're trying to find its residual. Um, that's the easy way to think about it. So here's the thing we're trying to expand. Um, so r1, we um, will assume that z plus 2 is our, is our one term. Uh, so theoretically we multiply by z plus 2 and then evaluate, but in reality what we imagine doing is taking g and obliterating the term whose residual we're trying to find and take the rest of the stuff and then evaluate at z equal to minus 2. And when we do that, plug it in, we get minus 5 halves. And the rest is pretty straightforward. I'm not going to um, bore you with going through all the details, but basically here we're obliterating and this is what goes here. Evaluate and we get 2. Um, then we're obliterating the z um, and everything that's left is here. We evaluate at z equal to 0 and we get 1 half. So we now have our three residuals um, and then we swing our z back over. y of z is going to be equal to z times g of z. So we get a z in each of those two terms, but this last term uh, had a z in the denominator because there was a root of 0, uh, and those cancel, and so that's what we end up with. Now, um, if we were to redo this example using MATLAB, after we divide by z, here's what we have. Now MATLAB needs all the coefficients, so we have to pass this z through, 
We don't have to do any factoring. We don't have to do anything like that. We just plug in uh, the appropriate coefficients uh, and away we go. Notice that since we have no constant term, we need a zero there. We get our residuals exactly as we had before. We get our roots just like we had by hand. We get an empty vector for our k telling us that there are no direct terms. Um, and so from this, um, we can um, immediately write out our form, swing over the z, and we're done. So it's very straightforward to do this. Now here's an example, one direct term, no repeated roots, no complex roots. You can do this by hand, but we're going to just um, do it by, by MATLAB. We plug in all of our values and we get um, we see that this is second order so we're going to have two residuals, two roots but notice that um, the um, order is two, the order is two so they're the same so P is equal to zero P plus one is one, we have one direct term and so let's look at what we do with that direct term. Our residual 3, uh, I'm sorry, 13 with the root 2. Our residual minus 4 with the root 1. And then the direct term is written down directly. Now we multiply both sides by z to swing the z over and we end up getting something that looks like that. And so then we would look for those terms on our Z transform table to do the inverse Z transform. All right, another example. Now we have two direct terms. Notice that the order is one more than uh, the denominator. So P is equal to one. So P plus one is two. So we'll have two direct terms. Um, we get the numbers here. Let's see what happens, how we deal with those. Um, so we have two direct terms, 7 goes with a z and 23 goes as a constant. And so I state down here that if there were m elements uh, in our direct term vector, the leftmost term would be a coefficient of order z to the m minus 1. So we've got a case where there are two elements, so 2 minus 1, z. Um, so if we had three elements, we'd have a z squared, a z, and a constant. Um, so very easy to do all this. Now, go back to the case where we have no direct terms, still no complex roots, but we've got a double root. Double root means that we've got a term that looks like this, some factor that has a square or a third. Um, so it's repeated factors. Um, so our roots are mine are I'm sorry our roots are one and two, but two is a double root. So when we um, do our residue command, uh, we see that yes there are no <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, we see that there are no no direct terms. Yes, that's because the order is of the numerator is less than the denominator. We get our residuals. We get our um, our poles, but now look what we have to do. Um, for the repeated, well, for the non-repeated root, we just take our 4 and our 1 and we form that. But for the repeated root, the first res residual that we get goes as we normally have. The second residual that we get goes with a squared version of that factor and then all the rest is the same. Okay, one last example. No direct terms, no repeated roots, but we have a pair of complex roots. Now, our complex roots will always appear as complex conjugates. Um, so if you don't remember what complex conjugates are, you ought to look that up and make sure you understand that. Um, so we um, put our stuff into um, our residue command, we can go directly from here and we see that we end up with complex roots and sure enough they are complex conjugates and the poles themselves end up being um, complex conjugates. So now um, we can uh, 
write this out just like we're used to uh, writing it out. Uh, and then uh, it's very helpful to convert these things into their polar forms and to convert these into their polar forms. Um, and uh, we'll see some examples of how to deal with this, but we can deal with this directly from our, our inverse C transform table um, without any trouble. Uh, so we'll stop there um, and I'll see you next time. Thanks.